bank stocks rip higher. Junior analysts at Goldman have complained about a crushing workload, thanks in part to a boom in SPAC deals. Uh, analysts are quoted as saying, my body physically hurts all the time, and mentally I'm in a really dark place. I've been through foster care, and this is arguably worse. I can't sleep anymore because my anxiety levels are through the roof. Joining me now is Hugh Son, uh, CNBC.com banking reporter. Hugh, uh, the, the way Wall Street can churn through uh, young entrants in, into the space is kind of legendary. So put this into context for us. How much of this is because of the pandemic? How much of this is what you would expect during a, a booming time? Hey, hey, John, nice to be with you, man. So it is, it, it's true that it's both, okay? So this has always been the case on Wall Street, certainly for the decade plus that I've covered it, which is that, you know, it's sort of a meat grinder, which is, it's, you think of it as this pyramid in which thousands of, of junior analysts start, you know, they graduate from college, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, do well in, in academics and, and be, be seen as a promising person on Wall Street. They get sucked into these programs and it's an indoctrination sort of a winnowing out process in which, you know, if your pain tolerance isn't high enough and you can't survive 100-hour work weeks, then perhaps you don't get to the next level of associate and, you know, and so on and hopefully climb that ladder. Mm. And so some aspect of this is timeless and is indeed sort of the hazing process that happens on Wall Street. And some aspect of this is, you know, the SPAC boom. And as we just updated our story on CNBC.com, you know, the epicenter of this uh, first-year uh, first analyst revolt, as I call it, is really the TMT, TMT group. So that's right. tech, Technology. media, and telecom. Yeah. And that's sort of, as you would think, the epicenter of this IPO frenzy. Well, it makes me wonder, too, though, how much of that old system is still relevant? Do they need to revamp it? Because, I mean, programmers in Silicon Valley don't get treated like this. I mean, the work is hard, but, you know, th there's a little more pampering that might happen in Facebook or at Google, Google, at least during normal times. I mean, is this necessary or is it some throwback to, like, fraternity culture that just filtered through to the banks? Perhaps a little bit more of the latter. I think you're getting to a really good point, John, which is that some of this is just uh, momentum from the way things have always been done. And particularly if you're a first-year analyst with Goldman out sitting on the West Coast on this TMT team, and, you know, you are in a culture where the VC money is free-flowing, uh, you could go to a startup and, uh, you know, spend some of your day playing foosball or paddleball or whatever. Uh, you know, it certainly feels as though... Uh, you know, and you're sitting in this spot waiting for emails to come in from New York or from Asia. You know, it, you know, if you're this first year analyst, it certainly feels unnecessary. And I think the real difference is it's always been that way. But, you know, now that uh, Goldman Sachs has a CEO who's on social media and who leads by example by being on social media, you know, it's harder for them to say, uh, you know, OK, we can't really, you know, we can have our CEO on social media and on Instagram. And yet, you know, when people complain, it eventually leaks onto Instagram that, that we can ignore that we can ignore it. You know, they know they can't do that. And so hopefully they've been working towards making their lives better. Hugh, I would never say things should exist because that's the way they've always existed. I'm, I'm just curious, though, what is the internal reaction to this? I would imagine there are plenty of people in Goldman Sachs who rose through the ranks, who went through that meat grinder, survived it, came out on the other side, making a huge paycheck now saying, you know what? That's the price you pay to be at Goldman Sachs and to get to the next level. And these guys are just being too soft. That's certainly, you know, look, I've reached out to people. And, and, and if you are in a certain cohort, if you're in your 40s or 50s, certainly, and you are maybe at the peak of your career on Wall Street, this is how you rose. You rose through the meat grinder, as you say, Melissa. And it's, you know, it, it is just a part of the process. And, you know, like a fraternity, you know, they, 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 you know, they, they pass that on year over year. Uh, you know, I, I think it's reverberated, certainly through Goldman. They hear it. Look, the quotes that John read at the, at the start of this segment, um, if you take them on face value, you, you really have to, you, ha you have to be hearing that people are potentially risking their health. Uh, and, you know, as we look, we talked about it, February was an incredible year, uh, an incredible month. It's almost equivalent to a real full year in SPAC <laughs> activity. And so there is some element of this, which is just an incredible frenzy, perhaps a misallocation of, of bodies in areas that needed it, that they need to adjust. And hopefully they can, you know, through a combination of moving people around and and just, you know, doing things more sensibly, just relieve the pressure on, on, these, on these poor people. Yeah. Yeah. And in this economy, talent still has options. Hugh Son, thank you.
Thank you, John. We did get a statement from Goldman on this. It reads in part, we recognize that our people are very busy because business is strong and volumes are at historic levels. A year into COVID, people are understandably stretched pretty thin, and that's why we are listening to their concerns and taking multiple steps to address them. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.